So today we have Gordon Lauk here. He is from the University of Zagreb and also uh, affiliated with the Universities of Edinburgh and King's College in London. Um, he's also leading the Genos um, Glyco Research Laboratory, so a private research institution um, in Zagreb. And he's coordinating the Human Glycome Project. So we worked together uh, in a big EU grant a couple of years ago. Uh, I didn't know what glycans were. He convinced us to work on it. We sort of co-supervised a PhD student, and I think now's the time that they're going to these really serious and big efforts from small-scale studies in the beginning. And he will tell us what the current state of the art is. Thank you, Anne, for the introduction and also for invitation. I'm very happy to be here and share some new insights into the Human Glycom Project, which we actually just uh, announced a few weeks ago. So we all know the holy grail of personalized medicine. We want to stratify people because currently we have wrong classification of diseases and people come in, got a diagnose, get a therapy, and therapy doesn't work. So you have to try another therapy, try another therapy. People waste time, people waste money. And ideally, we would like to stratify them up front, <clears throat> then have the appropriate therapeutic approach. And the majority of scientific community is focusing on genes as a way to stratify patients. And after analyzing probably over 20 million people, we'll still see very little translation of genetic data into clinical use. Okay, in oncology, there is definite clinical use at the moment. There is something in pharmacogenomics, a little bit in prenatal testing, but actually all those huge amounts of genetic data is not being translated into, whole day, in, into everyday life. And there are several reasons for that. One reason is that the genes are actually very far away from the final phenotype. There are many layers of uh, gene products, metabolites interfering, environment interfering, and all this in between is very complicated. And then the link between individual SNP and the final phenotype is actually very, very weak. And the other important aspect is that genes do not define everything. And the best example for that are identical twins, because identical twins generally do not get the same complex diseases. Usually, the heritability of complex diseases is way below 50, even sometimes below 30%. So these two pairs of twins, despite having exactly the same genome for their entire life, have obviously very different life outcomes. On the left-hand side, apparently some kind of a bizarre epigenetic chances changed the genomes of these two twins. One of them developed multiple tumors, the other one did not. On the right-hand side, two twins which were obviously different because of their lifestyle. So the fact that we share the same genes does not make us the same. And definitely, people are different. And the molecules in which we are the most different are the glycans. And actually, there was a Nobel Prize for that in, um, I think, 1930. Karl Landsteiner got this for discovery of the blood groups, because ABO blood groups are glycans. We just don't think about them in that way. And actually, glycans are one of four principal components of a cell. So the cell will have its nucleic acids, will have the proteins, will have the lipids, and will have the glycans. And glycans are actually the most diverse part of our entire molecular composition. And practically every protein which has been invented after the appearance of multicellular life is glycosylated. In total, more than half of all proteins we have are glycosylated. And this means that in addition to the polypeptide part, which is great gray in these figures, there are these glycan parts, which are shown in color. And then if we think about the function of a molecule, we cannot understand the function of a molecule without seeing and knowing these colored parts, because these are not the same molecules with and without glycans. And if we put a different glycan, for example, here, this will be a different molecule with different structural and functional properties. And this is very complicated. There are over 2,000 different glycan blocks which can be attached 
to a polypeptide backbone. So if you think about the genes where you have only four nucleotides, then we have 20 amino acids, then we have thousands of glycan blocks which modify the proton. And actually, the glycoproton is several orders of magnitude more complex than the proton. If you talk about approximately 20,000 genes, maybe 100,000 proteins, we are talking about tens or hundreds of millions of different glycoproteins. And this is why people tend to stay away from this topic, just because it's very difficult and very complicated. Even if we look at a very simple protein like immunoglobulin G, immunoglobulin G has a single conserved and glycosylation site in a heavy chain, and over 30 different glycans can be attached to this single conserved site. Since we have two sites on the two polypeptide chains, this means over 900 different glycoproteins can be made from a single polypeptide chain. And then with this huge amount of diversity, people tend to think that this is not important, that you can put any glycan on a protein and then the function will be the same. And in the recent years, it was clearly shown that this is not so. For example, this tiny little fucose, which has been attached, which can be attached to the core of the N-glycan, is either enabling or practically shutting down ADCC, antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. Or if you put salic acid on top of a glycan, the immunoglobulin can change its function from a pro-inflammatory agent into an anti-inflammatory agent. So IgG with this tiny little sugar on the top. Do you want to tell our levels on, the, on Zoom to mute with the microphone? Okay, so people on Zoom, can you please mute your microphones because we have some kind of echo in the room. Thank you. So if you put a salic acid on top, there's somebody still has a microphone on so we can hear my, myself talking two times. So please mute your microphones on Zoom. So this salic acid can change the pro-inflammatory into immunosuppressive role of IgG. Now, one can ask himself, how can tiny little change in a glycan change a function of a protein? Well, it's easy to imagine this. The only thing we have to think about is that alternative glycosylation has effects similar to coding mutation. So coding mutation is a change in a gene sequence which changes an amino acid, and then we know if we change an amino acid, we'll have a different protein, and the function will be different. A single amino acid change can kill you. But adding a different glycan to the site will have very similar effects to the structure and function of a molecule than having a different amino acid. And this was clearly shown recently by Adam Byron and colleagues for IgG. So... We have a situation that we have a polypeptide part of a protein defined by a gene. We can read our genes and know the sequence of our proteins. But then we have glycans with the different chemical compositions attached to these polypeptides, which are not directly encoded in the genome. So there is no genetic template for a glycan. There is actually a complex network of many enzymes working together to create a glycoprotein. So practically, glycoprotein is a biological structure, a chemical structure, that is inherited as a complex trait. So normally, genetically, complex traits are height, disease risk, or whatever. But here we have a chemical structure, which is a complex trait. And on this slide, you can see a network of genes which regulate IgG glycosylation that were identified by our GWAS studies in the last 10 years. I will come back to that later. So recently we did an experiment on mice because humans are not so easy to do experiments with. And in collaboration with Grant Morahan in University of Western Australia, we analyzed the cohort, collaborative cross cohort of mice. So he generated hundreds of mouse strains by crossing eight founder mice. So eight founder mice cross for three generations, and then inbred into strains. So we analyzed 100, 100 of those mouse strains, and we showed that these three generations of inbreeding, interbreeding, were sufficient to make mice different. So each of these mice 
had a kind of a distinct composition of a glycom. We can actually separate them by PCA analysis. So in principle, what we are seeing here, we are seeing here kind of a rapid evolution through alternative glycosylation. Because you have a glycan as a complex trait, you generate it by mixing different uh, allylic variants. You have a structure which is then heritable and which make these mice different. And in theory, this could be a reproductive barrier, and then if you separate them, you could have speciation at the end. But as I mentioned at the beginning, genes do not directly define glycans. They define maybe half of information in our glycome. The other half comes from somewhere else. This is an example of different cell lines producing immunoglobulins. They have more or less the same genetics. And this is one line in different time points, another line, another line. And they produce different glycomes, so each color is just a different glycan, in a heritable manner. So cell lines can produce different glycomes despite having more or less the same genome. And also people produce a very different glycomes. This is IgG glycome of six random individuals, each color just showing the different structure. So obviously we are different in the way we glycosylate our proteins. And contrary to the polypeptide part, which is fixed for a lifetime, so when you have your gene, your protein will be the same for the rest of your life. Of course, unless you, if you have a tumor and then the tumor makes a different protein, but the rest of your body will be making the same protein. But glycans are dynamic, glycans can change. So the analogy I like to use is that our body is something similar to our proton, can't change it so easily, but we can change the things we put on our body. So if we go in some kind of uh, cold environment, this would be a proper glycosylation of our protein. But if we move, for example, to Croatia in summer, this would be a much better way to glycosylate our proteins. And often, either from genetic or environmental reasons, people make mistake. We put the wrong glycan on the wrong protein at a given moment, which makes us less fit for the environment. And if we talk about the cell membrane, and the cell membrane, so in school we learned that the cell membrane is a lipid bilayer with the proteins embedded in this lipid bilayer. This is this tiny little white lane here. And when we look at the real cell membrane under the microscope, we see that the end of this tiny little lipid bilayer extends with a very thick glycan shield. So actually the real cell membrane are the glycans attached to the lipid bilayer, which then protects the cell. So when we talk about the cell membrane, proper glycosylation means these thick fortifications. Wrong glycosylation could mean these fortifications are broken. So this is short introduction about the importance of glycans. And a little bit more than a year ago on a conference I was organizing in Dubrovnik, we said, maybe it is time to launch the human glycan project. Maybe it's time time to coordinate our efforts to try to understand the structure and the function of a glycome. And after a little bit more than a year of negotiations, we formally started the Human Glycome Project in Dubrovnik on October 6th. We have a website, we have a Twitter account. If you're interested, you can follow them. At the moment, we have something like 33 research groups participating in the project, over 200 participating researchers. This is just in two weeks after we launched the launch of the project. We do expect this to increase substantially in the coming months, and we do hope to reach over 100 research groups before the end of the year. And this is a project we just started. At the moment, it works as a bottom-up approach, meaning individual researchers working in a field coordinate their efforts, but we do hope eventually to get some funding to have also the top-down approach. I like to make an analogy when the Kennedy started the, decided to put a man on the moon. This was something like a human genome project, you know, sound impossible in the late 80s, but through 15 years and several billions, it was achieved. At the moment, I think we are trying to put man on, on Mars, human glycon project. Most of the people think it's impossible, 
Most of the people think we are crazy, but tools are here and we can actually do it. And as I think the Musk will put man on, a, on a Mars in a few decades, we will resolve the human glycon in the coming the decades. So why is this so difficult? First thing is, it's very hard to analyze glycans. We do not have a tool to amplify glycans. So we cannot take a small sample and put it into PCR and get many copies. We have to actually work with the biological sample we take from a patient or whatever. And then we have to do many chemical steps before we actually put it on our machines. And this is making it very difficult to standardize and to make it into a high throughput assay. And to be able to join the other modern omics, we have to do it in high throughput. We cannot do five, 10, 15 patients. We have to do thousands of patients. And actually, at the moment, there are only two labs globally which work routinely high throughput glycomics. One is my lab in Zagreb. The other one is Leiden University Medical Center in Leiden. There are some attempts in Berlin and Dublin, a little bit in Beijing, but more or less nothing globally and nothing in US. And Whenever I come to us, my American friends tell me, you know, if nobody in America is doing it, it's not worth doing. Probably you shouldn't be doing that. And they kept saying that for the last 20 years until a few years ago, there was a very strong policy document by the US National Academies, which clearly stated glycans are directly involved in the pathophysiology of every major disease. So it's not longer me saying that, it's US National Academies endorsing this document. And that we need additional knowledge from glycoscience to realize the goals of personalized medicine and to take advantage of the substantial investments in the human genome and proton research and its impact of human health. So I don't have to go around and convince people that the glycans are important. I just pull out this major document. But the key change after this happened a few years ago was that uh, actually the Office for Strategic Coordination of NIH launched the Common Fund Program for Glycoscience. And now there are research grants dedicated for the development of tools for glycan analysis. For example, recently a colleague got a $10 million just to develop algorithms how to work with glycans. So there is a big potential to improve analytical and data analysis capacity in the US. Fortunately for us, we started 10 years earlier. Our first high throughput glycomic paper was published in 2009, where we analyzed 1,000 human glycomes. And so far, we have in our databases over 70,000 individual glycomes. And not any glycomes. We are sitting on a database where we analyze the most phenotyped and genotype population and clinical cohorts, mostly in Europe, some of them in China, and a little bit from US. So for all those 70,000 people, we'll have genetic data. For many of them, we'll have exome sequence, we'll have a whole genome sequence. There are many metabolomes, there are many microbiomes, all the clinical data. And what we are doing at the moment, we are mining the gold for these big glycomics data sets. Classical hypothesis-driven scientists tend to say this was a big fishing expedition. And I do agree, we did a big fishing expedition. But we accumulated the huge amount of fish, and these fish for us are the data sheets, and we can mine the gold out of it. And actually, it turns out to be a pretty uh, successful attempt. In a little bit more than a year, we have 10 high-profile papers, all of them based on glycom data combined with some other data. Maybe one example, something we did together with Jan a little bit more than a year ago. Elisa was the one doing the analysis where she showed that just by data analysis of what we have, she can actually correct the textbook knowledge. Because she looked at the data we have, made a model, compared it to what we think we know, and it didn't seem to be right, said maybe it looks a little bit different. We went back to the wet lab, tried it, proved it again, showed that actually her model is right and the textbook knowledge is wrong, and she published it in Nature Communications last year. And of course, the easy hanging fruit are the genes. And 
believe it or not, despite knowing all the genes that we have, the, the, the map of glycosylation is an uncharted desert because we know the enzymes which make glycans. We know the enzymes which degrade the glycans, but we know nothing about the network of proteins which regulates them. And this is where the GWAS approach comes in handy. You take all the people, you look at genetic polymorphisms, you look at a specific trait, and then you identify genes which seem to be associated. And the first exercise we did in this field was published eight years ago in Plus Genetics, where we identified that HNF1-alpha, a transcription factor which was previously not linked to glycosylation at all, is actually a master regulator of adding few codes to plasma protein glycans. It works on the multiple levels changing expression of a number of genes involved. An interesting thing about HNF1-alpha is that if you have a single defective copy of this protein, you will develop diabetes before the age of 45. So this is so-called maturity onset diabetes of the young or HNF1-alpha modi. Important thing about this subtype of diabetes is it should be treated differently. Can somebody please mute their microphone? We have Echo again. So people accessing this offline, can you please, uh, actually online, can you please mute the microphone? And if people have Modi, they should have a different therapy. And it's a more, more, way better therapy than the classical type two diabetes therapy with no complications and practically just a little bit of pill for the rest of your life. But they're not treated with this because they're not diagnosed. They're not diagnosed because there are no biomarkers. So we said, okay, if the FUCOs is regulated by this protein, then the people having defecting H and, defective HNF1-alpha should have changes in the FUCOs. And we did show actually People with Modi have very different levels of fucosylation, and when you look at the biomarker potential, this seems to be... Sorry? What do I do? We just do this for now. Okay. So... Uh, so can somebody... To turn off the microphone, please. Mute yourself. I think I'm muted now. No, but somebody muted me, so people will not be able to hear. <laughs> this is connected through the background. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, it turned out to be a pretty good biomarker. So we did a prospective clinical trial by recruiting 1,100 people, half in Zagreb, half in Oxford, sequencing everybody doing glycans on all of them. We did together with the Mark McCarthy. It was led by Professor Olga Gornick from my group. And we showed, actually the first result was quite disappointing. When we looked at all the mutations in HNF1-alpha, they were not really, glycans were not really predictive. But when we looked at the pathogenic mutations, glycans were really predictive. And actually, this opened up entire new opportunity for the use of glycans, and this would be to identify the functional significance of mutations. Because most of the time when people sequence the gene, when they see a novel mutation, they have no idea how functionally relevant this is. And in this case, glycans can be a readout. So this is a control. This is known irrelevant mutation. This was unknown mutation which was later shown to be irrelevant, and these are the functionally important mutations. So practically, we can use glycans as a readout to complement genetic sequencing to see which mutations actually change function of a protein. So, so you measure glycans in what cells? What? This was plasma glycum. Plasma. This was plasma glycum. Yeah, I'll come to that part. Good, 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 <laughs> good note at the moment. So uh, the thing with glycans is more complicated because it's not only genes. So in addition to having mutation, which is changing your gene, which is then changing your glycom, you can have epigenetic silencing of the same gene, which will have exactly the same effects on the glycom. And we did the first test just by doing correlations between the glycom and the methylation. And despite the fact that we're actually looking at methylation in, in um, blood cells and glycom, which was produced from liver, we did see some association. So the methylation does seem to affect 
like oscillation, and then we made a hypothesis. Could part of something we call type 2 diabetes could actually be a genetic silencing of HNF1 alpha, which then has exactly the same con uh, consequences of mutation in HNF1 alpha. So we did a small study because this was difficult to do. We looked into pancreatic samples from people with type 2 diabetes and without type 2 diabetes. And actually, we had to go and look into the uh, Langerhans islets. So the methylation in Langerhans islets seems to be different from the rest of the pancreas. And we did identify some patients with HNF and alpha, which have very high level of methylation, and some of them intermediate levels, but definitely everything about the normal, uh, above the normal range. So it seems that some patients with type 2 diabetes do have epigenetic silencing of uh, HNF1 alpha. The problem is to see them, we actually have to go into pancreas samples and into microdissect the islets and then see where the methylation changes. So not really practical diagnostic tool. And what we are doing at the moment, using the EpiCRISPR technology, which was developed by Vladka Zoldos and her team, we are changing methylation in this regulatory region and looking for functional consequences in in vitro assays. But we can use our databases of thousands of people to see what we see into those databases. And we looked into the glycomes of people with diabetes, and there does seem to be some information. And interestingly, it seems to exist even before disease onset. The FINRIS cohort was actually incident diabetes. We had several hundred people which were sampled before they developed diabetes, and we'll still see some information here. And we just finished a large study, this is unpublished data for the moment, where we looked into 1,000 prospective cases of type 2 diabetes, and it seems that glycans have more information than any other, actually than all other biomarkers combined to predict diabetes in healthy people, and probably we even identified a pathway because we looked, because, you know, diabetes is not a single disease. If you have a diabetes, you could have maybe 10 or 20 different molecular mechanisms which lead to loss of regulation of glucose levels. And one of them seems to be distorted when you have some kind of acute infection. So people with acute infection develop hyperglycemia temporarily. But this is known risk factor to develop diabetes type 2 later, and we can identify these guys based on their steady state plasma glycom composition. So look at the healthy person, and with nearly 95% confidence, you can say who of them will develop hyperglycemia in some kind of acute condition, and then you know that these guys are at high risk for type 2 diabetes. So our current stage of biomarkers for prediction of diabetes, which all resulted from the initial GWAS, of the plasma glycom is that uh, we see a subgroup of diabetes patients which have this risk factor, altered glycosylation in a steady state, and then they have a very high risk to develop diabetes in the future. So it's a subgroup of patients of diabetes. And at the moment, there is an attempt to reclassify diabetes, diabetes into several diseases, and we do hope this will overlap with one biomarker. And at the moment in China, we are starting a big clinical trial where we want to uh, recruit 10,000 people, identify those at high risk, change their lifestyle, and see whether this will actually prevent development of diabetes in the next few years. So what are you predicting here? We are identifying people at high risk to develop diabetes. So we don't have diabetes yet? No, we are looking at healthy people then we change their lifestyle. And then we follow them for the next five years and see how many of them will actually not develop diabetes because they're changed the lifestyle, despite having a high risk. So what I told you so far was glycomics. And when we do glycomics, meaning take off glycans from proteins and analyze them, we actually do the same mistake as people who take off glycans and ignore them because we lose the connection between the glycan and a protein. And actually, the best approach would be to do glycoproteomics, to look at the glycans of a specific protein and then check for its relevance. And the protein we are focusing on at the moment is immunoglobulin G. 
And we focus on immunoglobulin G from several reasons. First, this is the most abundant glycoprotein in plasma. And second, there is a huge interest in pharma industry to understand the relevance of glycans. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, this tiny little core few codes is a safety switch against ADCC. 95% of our antibodies have this safety, safety switch. They do not activate ADCC. Salic acid at the end is making immunoglobulin immunosuppressive. So instead of activating inflammation, it's actually suppressing inflammation. And of course, first thing is look into the cohorts, see what we can learn. In collaboration with the Tim Spector, we analyzed over 4,000 twins, and we learned that the average heritability is around 50%, but some of the glycans would be 30% heritable, some would be close to 80. And this is functionally relevant, because we know that if we give sick people infusion of immunoglobulins from healthy people, we have immunosuppression. So this is IVAG therapy. Immunoglobulins are used to treat some of the inflammatory diseases. And this acts by large through its glycans. And some people will be under continuous immunosuppressive therapy of their own IgG. So people who have very low pro-inflammatory and high anti-inflammatory glycans, they will be constantly suppressing their inflammation. While some other people would be promoting inflammation. And this has to be predictive for therapy outcome. And there are some papers now showing that the success of IVIG therapy depends on glycosylation of a patient, not of a drug. So the pharma industry is trying to make IVIG with more salic acid. But actually, it's maybe better to profile the patient before you give them the therapy. The same thing is happening with monoclonal therapies. So now eight of the 10 best-selling drugs are monoclonal antibodies, which are glycosylated. We are glycoproteins. And pharma industry is developing glycoengineered antibodies. So they're removing the core fucose from a drug. And the first example is on the market, oblituximab is much more effective than the rituximab just because it does not have this core fucose. But another aspect of the story is that you are putting this drug into a patient who has 15 grams per liter of their own IgG. So there is a competition between a drug and a host IgG for activation of effector functions. And this host IgG is very different from patient from, to patient. So the, the concentration of inhibitory immunoglobulins can be 20-fold different between two different patients. And you give them the same dose of the same drug, expecting that this will not have no difference. So something what we are doing at the moment, we are trying to link to the multiple clinical trials. We already uh, completed several of them, haven't published anything yet, but we did uh, submit two patent applications showing that the IgG glycom can actually predict outcome of the monoclonal therapy. In parallel, we are trying to understand how this happens. So also, IgG glycosylation is uncharted desert, and we are mapping it by doing a multiple GWAS studies. And this is our current network of genes. This is actually from a paper which is just about to be submitted, but by part also based on the three papers we already published, where we have approximately 30 genes which regulate IgG glycosylation. Interestingly, when we look at these 30 genes, they overlap with 94 different phenotypes at the SNP level. So the SNPs, which are known risk factors for Crohn disease, type 1 diabetes, lupus, even cholesterol level or Parkinson or dementia, are actually regulating IgG glycosylation. Of course, we cannot claim that it's IgG glycosylation, which is a functional effector for all of these genes. But probably for some of them, it's actually IgG glycosylation, which is the mediator of genetic risk, or it's a molecular mechanism leading to the disease. And we did a multiple studies, thousands of people with different diseases, recently reviewed in a, in a paper published a couple of months ago, where we showed that the changes in glycom we see in those diseases actually corresponds to this pleiotropy map where we do expect that a specific change in a glycom would be a risk factor for a disease. 
And often I get the question, how can IgG glycosylation be so important for diseases where IgG is actually not so relevant? And then I tend to show this picture saying, you know, IgG has multiple roles. Not only as a direct effector, but also as a molecule which is balancing inf inflammation, and by part it is doing it through its IgG glycol. And an example of the story that I will show you today is the inflammatory bowel disease, which we published the first paper three years ago with the Jack Satsangi, then from Edinburgh, now in Oxford, showing that actually patients with IBD have lost their immunosuppressive potential. So their IgG is not suppressing inflammation. And actually that IgG glycon can be used to stratify both cases and controls and CD against ulcerative colitis. And we did a larger application on 3,500 people through the IBD Biome Project, replicated this perfectly, published in gastroenterology earlier this year. The same project also resulted in another paper saying that the DNA methylation could be the mediator of genetic risk. And then we said, okay, genes, methylation is the regulation of gene expression. Does methylation mediate glycosylation? And looked into methylation of our GWAS hits, their promoter regions, and showed that actually methylation of those genes correlates with the glycom composition, suggesting that it's actually changing in methylation, change in methylation, which actually affects change in glycosylation. Similar thing we did together with the Christian Giger from uh, Helmholtz, where he showed, just by analyzing the huge amount of data we generated, that it's actually smoking which affects methylation, which then changes IgG glycosylation. So that uh, methylation is kind of a memory of environmental factors like smoking, which then changes our IgG glycom for a long time. And on the other end of the spectrum, when we don't talk about the uh, immunosuppression, then we have to think about the role of IgG in regulation of antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity. And we know that the FUCOs here is highly relevant. With and without FUCOs, the potential to activate ADC is a hundredfold different. And if people put too little core FUCOs on their IgG, they will be activating ADCC too much. We see it in inflammatory diseases. But if they put too much of the core fucose, then they won't be able to activate ADCC. So this should be relevant for cancer. We did a cohort of patients with colorectal cancer, showed that the glycons are different, and that actually information in glycons can predict mortality in colorectal cancer. And the key question here comes, are glycans cause or a consequence of a disease? Are changes in glycans cause or a consequence of a disease? Multiple papers now showing that actually you can see changes in the glycans a number of years before any other disease symptoms. And we recently published a paper showing that for rheumatoid arthritis, the, the difference between the disease onset and the sampling does not associate with the difference in IgG glycosylation, meaning it's a predisposing risk factor which then contributes to the disease development. Another example from the cohort studies, we looked in lupus and learned that um, salation, glycosylation, and bisecting gluconac are associated with the loss of kidney function, then looked into the healthy people, again with the TIMS 4,500 twins, showed that these changes also happen before any disease onset. It's just the kidney function which associates with these changes. So they do seem to be predictive in here. The same thing for hypertension. Glycans are changed in people with hypertension, but we do see a change already with the people with prehypertension. And this does associate strongly with the cardiovascular risk score. Again, on thousands of people, we did show that the glycan composition associates with the known risk score. Again, look into the prospective cohorts. People collected 30 years ago, thousands of them developing cardiovascular events in the subsequent years, showing that the glycans are as predictive as all other biomarkers combined for the risk of cardiovascular events. But uh, as I mentioned several times already, glycans associate with many different diseases. 
And actually, they associate in a very similar way with many diseases. So what we look here, these are the lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, type 2 diabetes, colorectal cancer. And they all go in the same direction. And actually, they go in the same direction as aging. So older people change in a pro-inflammatory way. Their IgG becomes more pro-inflammatory. And probably what we see here, we see an uh, increase in low-grade chronic inflammation, which is believed to play an important role in many different diseases. And actually, at the moment, there are big attempts to reclassify all inflammatory diseases because currently we classify them based on the organs and based on the symptoms. Well, actually, we should be thinking about molecular mechanisms. So we are part of two large projects. One is the CISCID and one is the 3TR in Europe, where we actually try to reclassify patients based on molecular symptoms. And one of the things we think is important is this low-grade chronic inflammation, which we see to develop with aging. So when we look at IgG glycom during aging, it changes in a way, and these are cohorts of over 1,000 people in each of them, that we are becoming more pro-inflammatory. And actually, these changes are so strong that if you take the IgG glycom, so I take a drop of your blood, take off IgG glycons, analyze them, I can predict your age plus minus nine years your chronological age. Now, when we published this, the editorial said, are glycans the holy grail of biomarkers of aging? And not because we can predict chronological age, because you know, predicting chronological age is not fun. You know it. I don't have to predict it for you. But what we can predict, we can see how fast is your actually biological aging going, because our lifestyle affects our molecular mechanism. So the, the chronological age goes with a known pace, but the deterioration of our body goes on, in the, on an individual pace. And what we see here that the difference between the age we predict based on glycans and the chronological age actually associates with all known biomarkers of unhealthy life. So practically with unhealthy life, we make our Ig glycan more pro-inflammatory, which then contributes to the disease development. We looked in some examples of known accelerated aging uh, models, like the Down syndrome, which was completely off the chart. We did see the accelerated aging of the IgG glycom. We looked into people um, infected with HIV, also saw IgG glycom look, uh, being showing accelerated aging. We went all around the world, collected samples we were able to get, 27 cohorts from different parts of the world, showing that different populations are different, but actually the inter-individual chain differences are actually larger than the population differences, something similar which is seen in genetics. But when we looked only for the differences, we saw that the differences in the glycom are practically on a line which expected lifespan and human development index. So somehow IgG glycom tracks how much um, we have been using our organism, how used up it is, and in a kind predicts how much of the life we have left. And these are all population data, so the question is, what happens to an individual? So can we extrapolate the population data on a single person? And what we see here, each dot is a person, each line is a connecting a person 10 years apart, and we do see that most of them go in the same way as a population data, some of them slowlier, some of them faster, but some of them go even in the opposite direction. So there is individual pace in the changing of our IgG glycom. And actually, we developed a test, which we call now Glycanage. It's actually a company now selling this test, claiming that this is the best biomarker of biological age. I'll show you just my personal example. This is me and this is my wife. We are more or less the same age, while my like an age is 73, her is 29, which is kind of cool. I have a young wife, but why is my glycan age so bad? So what have I done to myself to be more than 20 years older than I actually am? So my wife claims I eat too many desserts, which is kind of true. So I'm actually playing. I'm doing science of my, on myself because, you know, for me, it's interesting. For you, it might be completely irrelevant. And this is my glycan age with age for the last three years. And you see I'm aging, and then I somehow 
dropped and then I'm aging again. So this drop, actually the only thing which worked, and I tried many things in the last four years, is losing some weight. So I spent two months hiking in the mountains. I was socializing with those white goats. I hiked over 350 kilometers on the mountains and I lost 10 kilos. And actually it seems to be working. But then, you know, it was too difficult. And I, and I got my weight back. I have my 10 kilos too much now. And then I back on my old track. So it does seem that um, a deposit is a problem, especially the central deposit. And we did, a, we published a paper now on um, close to 800 people in Australia showing that it's central deposit, which is the driver of pro-inflammatory IgG. We did a cohort together with... Here? So G0 is a pro-inflammatory. G2 is anti-inflammatory. S is anti-inflammatory. So these are, this is the zero galactoses on IgG, two galactoses on IgG, salic acid on IgG. So these are three components which we use to calculate this glycan age index. So the glycan age index is a number we use to make it familiar to the non-scientists. On scientific concept, it would be pro-inflammatory G0, anti-inflammatory G2, and salic acid, which are kind of, these are the exact things we measure Left-hand side is a glycan age which we model. Uh, G2 and S are anti-inflammatory. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, of course. If so, this is the number of galactoses on IgG. G0 is zero galactoses. G2 is two galactoses. So if you put two, you don't have zero anymore. Of, of course. Uh, well, it has to because the, the sum is the sum is one. So if you have more G two, the G zero has to go down because it's uh, it's you know either you have or you don't have it. Yeah. Uh, so this study we did with Alin was uh, close to two hundred sixty five to eighty year old people exercising for thirteen weeks and on a diet their glycum did improve. Together with uh, Marcus Perola, we did uh, a bikini fitness competition. So ladies exercising vigorously to lose every gram of uh, fat. And actually, while they were doing that, they became pro-inflammatory. And not only on IgG and many other metabolomic markers, but when they stopped exercising, they returned to, to normal condition. So actually, too much exercise is not good for you. And at the very end, I have to acknowledge that this work has been done by a large number of people in my group. I have over 30 scientists, full-time scientists in my group. We have a very generous funding from a multiple European projects, structural fund projects, and we collaborate with dozens of institutions from all around the world. And we are very collaborative and interested in all cohorts which are interesting. And I will just end with this slide saying, glycans are directly involved with pathophysiology of every major disease. So whatever you are doing, if you are not looking at glycans, you are missing a big part of the picture. And I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Gordon. Any more questions? Uh, that was very interesting. Thank you. Um, we have an interest in obesity of diet and how that relates to pathophysiology. And I wonder whether, you know, analogous to the H1C data where you see increased glycation as a result of increased circulating glucose levels, whether circulating sugars are the ones that are in Okay, so the question about the uh, obesity, diet, glycosylation, and the glycans compared to the HbA1c. So uh, there's so increased glucose will also have a specific effect on glycosylation by making simply overflowing from a glycolysis into the into the um, glycosylation pathway by generating more substrate. So it is known effect that uh, high glucose causes more branching on the glycans. Higher branching on glycans is affecting the membrane half-life of many receptors. So we published recently a paper on type 1 diabetes showing that actually uh, glycosylation changes are giving you more information than just the glucose itself. 
So definitely diet would make um, first IgG more pro diet, um, high fat diet. Uh, I wouldn't say high fat. It's um, uh, obesity. So what we know for now, it's obesity. Obesity will make your IgG glycol more pro-inflammatory, which will then prevent you from suppressing inflammation. And it could have a similar, it could actually contribute to the HbA1c thing, which because HbA1c actually measures the chemical damage to proteins. So it's aldehyde reacting to amino group, just randomly damaging the proteins. On the other end, with changes in glycosylation, you will promote inflammation, which will then uh, make this tiny little change attacked by an antibody into an inflammatory process and killing the, the environment. So I'm extremely interested in effects on diet on IgG glycosylation. So the, the system is not responsive quickly because we are looking at glycosylation of a protein which has a, some kind of half-life. For example, IgG to be a couple of weeks. So in our intervention studies, we see very little after two months, a little bit after three months, and we don't have much data for longer studies. So it would be extremely interesting to look for longitudinal effect after some kind of a lifestyle intervention. So this is something I would really love to do. Have a cohort which had an intervention and had a long follow-up with some people actually dropping out, not following the diet anymore and then gaining weight, uh, uh, weight again and the other ones don't and what happens with the glycom. Oh, I would love to do that. So you say that um, for rituximab, the amount of glycosylation correlates with so it's it's a just in that specific case it's just a core fucose. So it's the one specific modification of the core of IgG, which is a safety switch for binding to FC gamma receptor 3A. So if you remove it, then the binding is hundred times more efficient, and you activate ADC more efficient. And then this is these glycoengineered drugs which do not have the core fucose and then they're more effective. So we have, you need much less drug to have the same ADCC effect. That's for rituximab or like No, the, 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 the glycoengineered version, the oblituximab. And does that apply also to PD-1 antibodies and, and the likes? Or uh, so one, one of the key problems is that for most of the monoclonal drugs we have at the market, we don't really know the mechanism. So nobody has really shown that, you know, you have to activate ADCC for this drug to work. So I don't know. We have to look. So this is something I'm also very interested in. If you have a nice cohort of uh, monoclonal antibody response, the key thing here would be, you know, how to quantify response. You know, what, what is the... And, and then to look into IgG glycosylation, whether it predicts it. So we are doing large, two large cohorts for uh, anti-TNF, and um, another monoclonal used for, um, for, for IBD. We have very little for um, anti-tumor monoclonals. So very interested to do so something. The mechanism of action of each of these antibodies different for, for PD-1, you're not trying to kill cells, you're just trying to block specific mechanisms. So I mean, it's no ADCC requirement. Yeah, so then, then it could be less relevant. I don't know. So, for women, it seemed to be a menopausal issue, so, which is also associated with changes in metabolic function. Yes, we did, we did one paper was published maybe a year ago. With actually, there was an intervention study where people were hormonally suppressed and then reconstituted. There is effect of estrogen, there is effect of testosterone, but not as strong as we see in the population cohorts. We also did... Uh, three months follow-up of, of 50 ladies with the weekly samples. And we do see uh, cycles which relate to estrogen concentrations. But the change we see there would be maybe 5 to 10% variation, while with the menopause, it's much larger. So 
Yes, hormones do have direct effect, but I think it's more than the direct hormonal effect. It's probably that we are also seeing the consequences of the changes induced by the hormonal changes. So we had a similar example maybe to that with the statins. We did two cohort studies showing that the glycans associate with the statins. And then when we did the proper randomized uh, placebo statin trial, there was no effect. So glycans were not actually affected by statins, but we were seeing a difference between people given and not given statins. Because, you know, if, if you are healthy, you're not given statins. So people who are not healthy were given statins. So this is why we saw the association with statins. So uh, personally, I think it's a low-grade chronic inflammation what we are measuring because IgG functionally affects low-grade chronic inflammation. So it's not just a biomarker. It's an effector molecule. I don't know how to do that. I don't know. If anyone's on Zoom, has a question, now's your time. I don't know if this ever happens. It does happen. Yeah, because I think we muted them. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> so I, I don't see. Yeah, I think. They can send you a tweet. Yeah, they can send yeah. you a tweet. So email me. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Gordon. Yeah. Okay, thank you.